Welcome, welcome, welcome to Planning Face Syndicate. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We have an amazing, amazing episode planned. We actually get to cover live X-Wing tournament that happened this weekend. Tonight, JJ and Charles are going to join me again about a local tournament that happened in Florida this past weekend that Charles just happened to get top three in. We're also going to be talking about some of the different changes to 2.5 how they've affected the player base, and if we feel that we're going to be seeing, I don't know, maybe some sort of a downturn. Do we get more players in? And we're going to be having that whole type of a conversation to see how the game is shifting and whether that is good or bad based on our personal opinions. We're also going to be talking and starting our series on the conversation I wanted to have about scenarios. So JJ originally said, hey, Chris, I want to break every faction down. I want to go through all the factions and go through what are the best ships? What are the, you know, good combos for this type of faction? I said, well, here's something better. This is what we're going to do. It's going to be even better than that. What we're going to do is we're going to take each scenario and then we're going to look at all the different factions and see which combos, which lists fit together the best and kind of give them a, I don't know if I want to call it a, a rating or a scorecard or anything, but what we're going to do is track some of that. And then at the very end, we're going to see what are some of the commonalities between each of the lists and the faction for each scenario? So this is going to take a, this will be a five week stint. Hopefully they don't. Uh, and maybe we'll cover two in one weekend next week or something like that. But hopefully they don't change points too much, <laughs> but either which way, what we're going to do is kind of look at that because our theory is, is if you can understand each of the different scenarios, the primary win condition based on your, your play style and your faction, you can build lists to tailor yourself to that. Then you could take and compare each one of the different lists you've built and how it fares in each scenario to give yourself a baseline probability on how well you would do if you went to a tournament. Again, we're not going to discuss factors of player um, ability, right? So, for example, me picking up certain types of factions will uh, inevitably mean I will 100% lose no matter what. Um, whereas I have an advantage in SEPs uh, over other um, factions. But we're going to take all those um, variable pieces and kind of throw them to the side and just analyze the base of what we can do. With that being said, let's bring in our co-host for the night, Mr. JJ, the shittiest hat in the world, Johnson <laughs> and Charles. I came in number three and you can suck at Tanner because I came in higher than you. Dillman, how are there you was like there were 12 people dude like don't don't do that there were 12 people hey i finished hey, in the you, top 25 percent. don't I'm do that to yourself i'm giving i'm giving you all the props for your top three so to be fair for anybody that's watching at no point did i ever say suck it tanner i finished <laughs> better than you yeah, at yeah. no point was that ever a thing <laughs> we'll see Anyway, how's it going, fellas? I, I know you had a tournament this weekend, and it's exciting, right? I was actually thinking about flying down there. Very glad I didn't. Um, I ended up getting a call today for being on call, and that would have sucked if I was on a plane. <laughs> oh, damn. I got in a little yeah. bit of trouble. So, Well, it was great. Um, it, was, it was fantastic to see a lot of players um, from our area to come in and play at a local tournament. Uh, got to got to see a lot of people that I haven't seen since the 2019 regional show up there um, and and just say hi, you know, and meet a, a few more people um, that I've talked to on Discord as well um, and some of the other servers like Nickel City and stuff. Uh, seeing Pim and meeting him, uh, Andrew Pim from Pim and Miniatures in person, really great guy. And, uh, and of course, Crispy was there as well. Um, fortunately, we didn't get to battle this time, um, so we haven't resolved our, our, uh, our tie, um, but he did have a match with charles and uh and we'll get to that in a bit but uh it was fantastic to see everybody again uh thank you again to bearded squadron and george barrios who uh organized the events and had fantastic prize support for everybody i mean uh almost everybody left with something um from the tournament there uh which is fantastic and um and yeah it was a lot of fun I enjoyed that i was able to finally get all the alt arts and crap that i collected at lvo I uh, was finally able to offload all of my my extras and and give them away as raffled prize support and stuff like that. So it was really cool. Um, there were some people there: Andrew Cox, uh, Marcus Morton, um, and a, oh, what is his name? I can't think of his name. Uh, Clint, 
Clint Chambers yes. and oh, what is is it Aaron? Yeah, Clinton Aaron. I haven't seen since the regionals that we did at or not regionals, the store championship that we did at Cool Stuff cool Maitland. Stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was the last time I saw a lot of the crew that was there yesterday. So it was really, really cool seeing a lot of familiar faces and people that I had played 2.0 against. Um, being able to finally go in and being able to dive in into, into 2.5 and seeing how it affected, uh, you know, people's play styles and what they did. So it was a lot of fun, though. Awesome. And I think that's kind of the, the thing here, right? Is, is is Charles says this is your first time being able to put shifts on the table in a tournament setting with the new rules. Um, well, probably even since the pandemic, really. Like, LV, yeah, well, I you mean, did I've, go to LVO though. So you but LVO, LVO was LVO was two point rules. Yep. The only the only thing that had changed for LVO was road. Yeah, and and I I don't even think we did we. I'd have to check with John, but I don't think they used obstacle rules. I think it was old school. The only difference was that we added road and there was a, uh, a uh, the timer, the the round timer. Other than that, I don't think LVO had really any of the new rules other than road yeah. for random turn order. Other than that, it was 2.0 with an extra bureaucracy ruling. So this was my first time, like, ships on a table. I played it on TTS a couple times, but... This was the first time physical plastic on a table with the new rule set for me at all. Um, I will say that it is much, much easier to just fold the corners of your mat in <laughs> to find to find yes. the center of the mat than trying to measure that bastard. Um, yes, and far. I will say that I really enjoyed the fact that like George gave and I will say that it took considerably longer. Um, but George gave everybody the chance to get all of their objects on the board and all of the yeah. objectives on the board and everything before starting the timer. If that was part of the game time, like setting that up and doing that whole thing, um, that would drive me insane. I I would probably hate yeah. that. Well, and that's kind of how we yeah. went uh, with LVO or not LVO with Adepticon. Adepticon. Is it, you didn't, there was nothing. You got X time between. The best part about it was when it took um, when your opponent wasn't there and you just focused on setting up because you threw your objective out. <laughs> you were like, OK, here's my objective. I'm going to put this out now because he, they're not there and just start setting up on my world. I on my games went to time for all but one. And um, I was always the late one <clears throat> to the party, except for the one time when we, JJ got and I got to eat. Pratillos. Yep. <laughs> that was good, man. It's good food. So, Charles, let's because yep. yeah, we've we kind of already heard from JJ because he's already done <laughs> this before. Um, so so give us on a high level your impression of 2.5 on the table, right? Like I know we've talked about it for a month or two, but that doesn't mean anything until you put shit onto the table. No, no, absolutely. And and I will say that, like, and we were talking about this off air, and should Marcus ever hear this, um, I don't think he watched the podcast, but he might, who knows. Um, Marcus is an amazing X-Wing player, right? His skill set and the way he processes things, like his ability to fly Jedi at the beginning of 2.0 was, like, second to none. Like, he is yeah. a ridiculously good X-Wing player. He even won uh, the Nova Open uh, pre-COVID. Um, to see him in person, and this is, you know, outside of like, um, league nights where they're just farting around on the table. I think this is the first tournament that he has been in post COVID and he went 0 and 4. So to say that it didn't change anything about the game is completely wrong. Um, so we got lucky. Our first round was chance engagement. So it was 2.0 with an extra ability to score points. Right, that's it. That's what chance engagement is. It's it's 2.0 with the new build rules, but the objective in the center that nobody gets to claim because everybody crowds the center to prevent people from claiming it. Um, second round was scramble? Uh, yeah, scramble the transmission, and then assault was the third. Yep, and then the fourth was the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Array, right? 
No, uh, Scramble was second, Cargo was third, and then Assault, which was the one that we played, was the last yep, one. Yep, yep, okay. So, I mean, we got to try every one of the scenarios, which was nice, because it was a four-round tournament. So we got we got to have the opportunity to try every single scenario with our lists. Um, I will say that it is a pain with the list that I flew um, in that fourth scenario where I played against JJ, where having to keep the ships near the uh, the objectives um, really allows people that have the multiple small ships versus you know big ships and stuff. It allows them to be a little bit more mobile and a little bit more. Uh, flighty as far as like maneuvers and getting around stuff whereas my list um i flew three big base tanks and so it was getting to an objective and just sitting on it and unfortunately with the big base tanks it's really hard to dodge uh when you're doing zero maneuver zero stop maneuvers and rotating with the because when you rotate with the uh with rook cast and i'm glad that i did this because i was finally able to find kind of like a chink in that armor if you will um with Rook, when you do the zero stop and you rotate, um, if you already have, say, like from your previous round, you took a, um, not a deplete, the other one, a, a strain. strain. You took a strain token, which lowers your defense by one, down from two to one. If you do the zero stop with the rotate, the wings go up, which lower you down even one more. So you, by doing the zero stop turn, you may give yourself an offensive shot, like a really good offensive shot, but you also open up that gauntlet fighter to just get torn apart because no green dice from two green dice can, can change the complexion of a game. Um, I will say again, um, and I am a firm proponent of this, that all four scenarios need half points. There yeah. were many games that would have ended much quicker um, and would have had much different outcomes if my 36 point or my 36 health list uh, gave the ability for half points. Uh, there were many times that points were denied because there were no half points. Uh, the games would probably go a little bit quicker and people would be a little more careful where they place their Jedi or where they fly their, you know, their high agility ships because one or two damage on a high agility ship can give you a pretty decent point swing depending on who the pilot is. So that's that's my take. I ha I had a lot of fun. All the scenarios are fun. They're inventive, um, and it's just it was just I had a really good time. I again have forgotten how much of an endurance sport in person X wing is. Um, by the end of round three, my back was sore from hunching over the table and i was i was ready to be done for the day after four rounds i can only imagine six rounds we just got to cut your legs off charles you gotta you, we gotta cut them off give you like mechanical legs like all lieutenant dan <laughs> lieutenant dan has magic legs there you go all right so why don't we go ahead and get into the list um so right here to begin with this is kind of the cut there was 16 players in total um not everybody submitted lists. It looks like in the top eight, um, which I don't think we're going to go over top eight. I don't know what we're going to go over it because I guess JJ prepped this piece. Uh, but essentially, these are the players that uh, that played. I want to go through real quickly uh, some of the rounds just real quick, just to kind of look at some notable things. Um, if you look at most of the scores, uh, they are similar to what we had been seeing. Um where we've been seeing 20 points to typically 10 or 11. But the player was an asshole. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, Mr. Mr. Andrew. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, somebody else will have to tell us if you were an asshole yesterday. Um, but it, we we're, what we're seeing is, and, and this is kind of where Greg's data came in from Nickel City, was <laughs> we are seeing, you know, 20, 21 point wins um, to 11 to 12. So if you look at the first game or the last game, they're not as close. Um, again, they don't have the scenario names, weirdly enough, in here. I don't know why. Um, but if you look at rounds, we are actually seeing six rounds is a decent average, um, actually. So if we go back I to think four. Every, I think every game that I played went six rounds. I don't think I had many go beyond that. I will say um, the reason that some of this data was missing uh, number one, I don't think George has ever run 
a tournament completely through TTT. And there have been some changes in the score submission and the way things are done in TTT uh, that made it a little bit more difficult. So like when you were pre 2.5, when you were submitting your score, it was win loss and points for each side and go yep. right now they're collecting uh, objective points, wins, how many rounds you went and whether or not the game went to time. And all of that has to be input before you can put the scores in. So there's probably some pieces of this missing because TTT has adjusted their formatting and people just aren't used to it, which is why the scenario names are probably not in there. Yeah. Which is, again, that's okay. I, I think for a smaller tournament like this, I think we're, you know, we're good. Really, I'm looking at the the rounds and then the point differentials. And the point differentials are still, we're still seeing it. And then we when it we get to a little bit later, we could talk about the half points piece um, if we want. I like to see that we're hitting six rounds on average, though. I will say that is a benefit, in my opinion, compared to um, Adepticon was, I think we came in at, what, four and a half, right? Four and a yeah, half to five right. point mm -hmm. two or something like that. And we're so seeing a stout six rounds here. Well, I was going to say, statistically speaking, though, we have to look at one major difference, and it was something that we had just discussed. At Adepticon, your time started. It was set up and then game all as mm -hmm. part of the time. Here, George didn't start the round timer until everybody was at turn one. All right, fair. So you know, all that's, ships that's are placed, enough. all dials are down, all objectives are in place. Both players are at the table. Everybody is ready to go. Start the timer. So when we really look at that, that setup time equates to yeah, essentially two rounds of game time. If at Adepticon you didn't have that capability, and every game only went to four. And here we had that capability, and every game goes to six. Statistically speaking, on average, that would state that the the setup of the game, discussion of lists, objectives, and you know ob obstacle placing was that's that's two rounds of game time. Yeah, so it depends. Uh, I would say we hit five was our. I think if we go back to the numbers, five is our average. But I get your point, though. Your 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 point is very fair. I mean. Around is you know is easily a fifteen minute piece right there. Mm -hmm. So you getting an extra fifteen minutes between games makes sense. It, yep. it, it hundred percent makes sense. All right. So the winning list was Jacob Browning with yep. Republic. The irony of it all seems like Republic's gonna be around till we nerf them. Um, I will say Jag in the arc is definitely a new twist so jj's gonna i don't look know what jag. his ability is yep jj's gonna look that up for me because i don't i don't know what that is either <laughs> so it's actually a very uh solid ability for jack he's an initiative three arc 170 pilot um hey i'm pulling up his uh, ability now so essentially uh his ability works when another friendly is defending he can uh, acquire a target lock uh, so the official reading I did is after friendly ship, I bring one to two in your side arcs uh, defense. You may acquire a lock on the attacker. So coming in at initiative three and he has other Jedis um, next to him um, in that in that big bubble, um, he automatically gets that lock so he can go in, take an objective with Jag. And if they decide to shoot one of his other uh, teammates, now he has an offensive mod uh, to to use against the attacker if he has them um if he's in that range. And so that's a really, really good pilot. Yeah. So essentially they have Jag with expert handling, which is just the white barrel roll. Ion torpedo, seventh fleet gunner. Um, and, and so the seventh fleet gunner, right? Can't work on him. It can work on his teammates though. Correct. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Wolf has the same thing. Seventh fleet gunner, veteran tail gunner and expert handling. Plo with uh, Chopper, Thread Tracers, uh, and CLT. Barris with Clusters, R7A7, which I think is the Crit Bot, and CLT. And good old Contrail, uh, who you never get rid of. And Contrail with Esk, it, he has the Ion, the Ion one. Um, I wonder if he ever spent it. Did he ever yeah, spend I didn't it have the... I didn't have the opportunity to play him um, 
uh, on in this particular. Oh, like, we had we had losses in our win loss record. <laughs> yeah, we, he went we four both and had oh. one loss. Yeah, he went four and zero oh with this. He list, went four and zero. Oh. So. Yeah. So I think overall a solid list, similar to what we've been seeing before. I will say, Plo with Chopper and uh, Thread Tracers is pretty unique. Um, and I guess if nobody got to see how we played. I don't 100% know how this list does better than some of the other Jedi lists. Um, I want to say that I played two Jedi lists, and both of them had Chopper on one of the ships. Yep. And, it, and your typically ability you see to it on hand out those jams. Yep. Yeah. Like, I, I just, I guess I've never, I've just not seen it on, on Plo, and I've not seen Threat Tracers on Plo. So I will tell you that, that the Threat Tracers on Plo, I understand the logic in it, that, but that's, I don't know, that's just crazy. I guess it makes sense because then all your other, everybody else just focuses. He's an I-5. I don't know. I can see it working. So. No one's think of aim, though. No, I don't. I'll be honest. I don't fly Republic enough to have an opinion on this other than, oh, uh, Pim said he was his only loss. He never used Chopper or Threads. He did use Seventh Fleet Gunner twice with Plo and annihilated some Y-Wings. Yep, and that, that that's where we've seen it before. Like, even before we went to Adepticon, um, God, I can't remember the gentleman's name in Detroit. Um, he comes over and plays locally with me or with our team uh, every once in a while. But anyway, he was he was doing shenanigans with some Fleet Gunner and Plo just off the charts. And Plo can do his weird things to hand things off, and yep. uh, it, it's real like Plo with five dice is pretty good. So yeah. Anybody with five dice is good. That makes anyone with five dice is as good as Fenrao. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. And you have the force to yep. to mod fucking force. All right, who wants to take? Well, we're gonna give JJ the I'll, second one because. Oh, I was gonna say I'll do it because we both lost to him. Yeah, I ahead. believe. Yeah, we, so he was, was he was our uh, our only loss. Yeah. Yep. This was um, uh, Matthew McGowan. Uh, one of the bearded squadron guys, super nice guy to play against. Um, you yeah. had Hawk with Ayala Sakura. I don't remember him using Ayala Ghost Company or Cody at all during my match with him at he all. He did use Ghost Company on my match. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mace with CLT, Foresight, and R4. Ahsoka with CLT and Chopper. Uh, Luminara with CLT, Foresight, and R4. And then Barris with CLT, Clusters, Instinctive Aim, and R4. Um, and he definitely used this very well with me. I think I got Luminara and Barris, or no, I got Ahsoka and uh, Barris off the board. Uh, at the end of our match, he still had Hawk with maybe one shield down. Mace was at full health, and uh, Lum I either Luminara or Barris, I don't remember which one I killed, but the other one was on the, I think, had gotten through shields. But his dice were solid. His play was solid. The way he flew his ships around and utilized the uh, the fine tuned controls, and he utilized so Ahsoka crazy with the fine tuned controls plus spending a force to do the other action plus getting like her being able to do three actions around is just bonkers. Yeah. So Ahsoka is one. Yeah, Ahsoka is definitely one uh, that everybody should be on the lookout for. But that. This hawk, the only thing different on this hawk is he's using the ghost company to do the double taps um, with the commander Cody to throw out the strain. Um, whereas typically I've seen um, Sekiro with um, the barrage rockets. But, you know, again, having two support pieces in Republic seems to be pretty decent. Uh, and we all know, you know, Barris, that's a little different loadout for Barris, but again, still very potent. That was the original loadout I used to run with Barris. in fairness, uh, when I first started running Republic for Adepticon. That's how I liked her. But concussion missiles, when they go off, are can be very, you know, aggressive. So Especially in, and, and I think concussions are even stronger now um, because there tends to be a large concentration of ships around any given objective. Uh, so in the right scenario, concussions can change the game because you can hit a ship and just like it explode around you. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's why a lot of people have been using it with the instinctive aim. It makes sense. You don't have to use her. You can use her either way. 
and the mm-hmm. concussions are just there as a threat. I like yep. clusters better just because of that, but I found that they don't hit they weren't hitting hard enough to make it worth it in the long run. Um based on the type of squad I was running. In that squad mm-hmm. it probably works in my in mine it did not. So all right. Number three, the guy who beat me. Who who whose list is this? Uh, this is my list. Um uh it's you, a list. You're gonna go I've, over it, so yep. I, I played this on stream a couple of times. I think I did once on Nickel City. Um, but it's Rook cast in the gauntlet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, with Rook, if you uh, before you engage, you can choose to take a strain. Uh, if you take a strain, um, or if she is strained, um, you can change a blank or a focus to a hit result. Um, using the swivel wing because it's free, Ahsoka Tano because she's the cheapest force carrier that I, I have available to me as scum. Uh, overtune modulators, which during the system phase I can spend and give myself three calculates. Uh, and then at the end of the round, whatever calculates I still have turn into strain, which oh no, more more free hits from <laughs> from from focuses and everything. So darn, that's terrible. Um, and then cutthroat so that I can recharge overtuned if someone gets through Lando or Bosk. Uh, running Lando with uh, the child. Uh, which is just two force and it gives people free target locks. But I'll be honest with you, other than my game against JJ, nobody shot at Lando. Lando just circled the outside of the board and did pot shots at everybody. He didn't take a single damage until my game against JJ. Uh, I ran Boba Fett Gunner, which never triggers, but hey, why not? Uh, False transponder code. So when they take their free target lock against Lando, I can break it at least one time. Hull upgrade and the Falcon title, and then everybody's favorite brown ship, uh, Bosk in the YV triple six with gamut key, so I can keep tokens, Zam, so I can double tap, Greedo, so I get free crits, uh, false transponder codes, and marksmanship, which triggered surprisingly often when I was shooting people with Bosk. Um, it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of hull to get through, uh, and when there's no half points, it it's just a pain to, to try and get through everything, except for apparently JJ, uh, who tore through Bosk in like three shots because I took a uh, structural damage and got zero green dice, which means I ate every ounce of damage he put into Bosk. Yeah. So now I have a couple of questions, right? Yeah. So why Lando over, let's just say Q9? So Q9, Q9 is you're talking about that, the the um Razor Crest pilot. Yes. Okay, so number 1, just a just a quick answer. I didn't have the Razor Crest when I built this list. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Fair. <laughs> so, Fair. So yeah. that's why I picked it up the night before. Um but just for me, I had the Falcon. I like the way that Lando is able to utilize the stress to reroll so I don't ever have to take a target lock. I can always take a focus or a rotate action because I don't even need the focus because I have the child for force. So I have the rotate action or the red boost available to me at any given time. Um, and I don't, it's it's all sorts of passive mods with Lando because you can reroll offense or defense. So that's why I went with Lando because I know my play style and I've still not played with the, uh, the Razor Crest at all yet. So, all right. So then the other question is how often was a child? So you said nobody shot at Lando. Yep. So obviously you had it's basically two free calculates whenever you needed them. Yep. I mean, how often were you shooting more than two dice with Lando? A lot. And is that just because everybody was stressing to do yep. the different actions? Okay. Yep. Because everybody was stressing. Anybody I shot at had stress. <laughs> and with Lando, target priority was always whoever had stress over who didn't. Yep. And here's where TTT does a little bit of a, a in my opinion, a failure because it doesn't capture ship kills versus objective points. What was your ratio of objective points to ship kill points? Um, I would say that most of my points came from ship kills. Um, just because I threw a, I flew a three ship list. Um, the, the one where you can pick up the objectives and carry them with the ship. I do okay with that one. Cause I can get three of those and carry them around and I do all right with it. Um, but realistically speaking for the ones where you have to be within range, um, 
of like within range one of the objective to score any points. Um, they didn't really do well. The only reason I did well against JJ was because the scenario that we played um, made my big body ships count as two. Yeah. So I was running a six ship list for the purpose of being near objectives. And they're so big that depending on how the objectives are placed, um, there was at one point where I was able to have two ships at range one of two different objectives. So it was like having four ships at range one of an objective, which yeah. gave me some points. Um, other than that, um, I still stand by having more ships is, is better. But most of mine were swatting people out of the sky. You can't get objectives if you don't have the ships to get the objectives. And taking a ship off the board that's three, four, five, or six points is worth more than sitting on objectives. Yeah, and I just wonder because in my testing with some of the so like I've been running Rook with um uh Rook and Mando and Q9. And if I can get the kills, great. But if they if they have enough power firepower, I'm just screwed no matter what I do. Especially yeah. when Rook takes that strain, you know, or when over two modulators popped and you get stuck with two strain because you roll natties and then you're like, oh, I can't double tap, you know. Um right. You know, Ahsoka is different twist. Did you ever use Ahsoka for anything other than a force point? Nope, not at okay. all. She, I, I told everybody that I played, they were like, why Ahsoka? And I'm like, because she's like, I think she's six points, nine, nine points. So she's yeah. the cheapest possible force carrier in that slot. Yep. That's that's the only reason it's Ahsoka versus anybody else. I tried um, Maul at 10 and it was okay. I tried Savage at 10 and I really like Savage. But for an additional point off, which gives me the ability to throw like cutthroat in there or something else, I can get the same force point with an ability that eh, if I get to use it, cool. If not, meh. But it's it's there. Now you could think of or bumping up to Savage, dropping your hull upgrade, and then you can add your veteran tail gunner as well in case you get those secondary shots. I found veteran tail gunner only goes off on that ship once or twice a game and most of the time it's spent so people don't try to get behind you that's what i've used it for like i'm bo katan yep. that's where i that don't get behind bo because she's just going to shoot you too yep and i will say that that my my loss that i had yesterday was because they were able to get two jedi behind bosk and just rip him apart uh yeah. if you can get behind bosk and i don't have anybody to protect that back end he just there's a puff of smoke and he's gone um but luckily rook and uh rook and lando tend to be pretty stout on the other end and because there's so much hull to get through to get the points normally we're close to time by the time they get through one ship or you know one and a half of my ships just because the games are only going six rounds um so i have to with a list like this i have to play super aggressive I have to get in there. I have to throw dice. I have to try and kill something every turn or the amount of objectives they can take over me and the amount of ability to arc dodge and stuff like that will just rip me apart if I'm not in the mix and taking shots. And I will say that most games, because of the way the objectives were placed, um, we were shooting round one. Like yeah. there were four, four straights out the gate to get to it puts you with a big base ship range three so we're throwing dice round one which as an x-wing player i love i hated 2.0 and 1.0 where there was like three rounds of jockeying for the proper engagement now i want i want to attack i want to be aggressive this fits my play style so but yeah, yeah that's and, my list yeah so if you go with q9 you get three more loadout points with it um, so that's the, really the only advantage. And I guess you get an initiative four. Yeah. Um, is there a, just out five. of curiosity, is there a difference in, in life points like hull shield versus yes. oh, hundred percent. Yeah. You, you have 11 with Lando and you only get nine with Q nine. Um, so you, you are off by two. Yep. And one of those is a shield. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. so to, to Charles's credit, right? Um, since I lost some in the in the last round, 
the way he plays with Lando, like he keeps and Lando with the with the the arc facing up the sides, right? So that way he can jump from the first objective and then uh, do like either a four straight or a three bank around and come around the edge of the board to hit the back objective on the opponent's side and just kind of harass around the edges while he has Boss covering the center and Rook coming in from the other side aggressive as well. So that way he can form that kill box in the center. And with Q9, um, he isn't able to do that as much because he wants to kite around as much as he, as he can with Lando um, and giving him just that that reliable avenue to to still capture objectives around the corners around the sides and still um like throw out shots as much as he can and since a lot of the ships are are, are stressing for like additional actions or if they bump and they take that red focus lando's always pretty much going to have a, a three die gun all the time now um with the new rule set um so i think that is his strength um having lando uh, versus q9 q9 can be good um it's just he's not going to be able to pull that same tactic uh with uh with q9 that he's going to have with lando so. i think if i could switch this up and again it's hindsight and it's going to be scenario based and depending on my opponents because they could dive in on lando and just murk him but honestly i would probably drop the child in in favor of trick shot why not drop boba fett gunner too often did that go off uh never because yeah. it never went off because you have the bow tie arc yeah. and so you have to have no ships in your arc other than the one you're shooting at and because the field is so massive with the amount of ships it never triggered so I've, if I could, if I could fit it into that build, I would love to have Kira and Trickshot just to give me yeah. the uh, the additional die shots yeah. and everything that goes there, um, without giving them the the shot back at you know that sort of thing. I would love that because I love that build on the Falcon, but I'm not going to complain because Lando was amazing, and I will say that probably was responsible for more damage than any other ships. The other two ships with three dice uh, primaries did get most kills, but Lando peppering in damage from the outside with two or three dice, forcing people to spend tokens because he's an I-4. So Lando at I-4 and Bosk at I-4 with Root uh, cleaning up at I-3 um, was really strong. Lando and helped shit. me strip some tokens. You With quick trick shot, Kira... False transponder codes and hull upgrade and the title. You still got four fucking points, bro. Like right there. I mean, like you could keep Boba if you wanted, or you could go with Agile Gunner, or you could put a missile. I guess I don't know if I'd put a missile. That seems silly. Um, um I would say either uh, Hot Shot Gunner I was because say an illicit needs to be in there if I've got oh, yeah, the four true. points. Yeah. Well, you have false transponder. Yeah, but there's another illicit slot. Oh, you want to put another one in? Yeah, what what do we have options? Pull that. Uh, down. You could put rig cargo shoot overtuned. Contraband uh, would be nice. You could put contraband. Yeah, technically you could put contraband. Because I could in I there. could sloop to rotate or to spin that arc around or. There you go. And then even, put, you know, even putting overtuned on him wouldn't be terrible. Because yeah, the one bank, over... the one bank with the Falcon is a blue, which I will say, our our resident expert on everything X wing, uh was really surprised when I did the one bank and shed a stress. And he's like, that's blue. He's like, with resistance yeah, and yeah. rebel, it's not. Yeah, and exactly. I was is. so caught off guard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only good thing this scum Falcon can do. Yeah. Yeah. No shit. But hey, Compared I had a good fall. time. Good list. So let's move on to the next one. Cause I don't want to sit there. So yeah. All right. Andrew Lippins. So JJ? I'll cover this one here. Uh, so Andrew, also known as Pim from Pim Miniatures, uh, great guy, great guy. Um, so he was flying the resistance and did very, very well mid finishing in the top four here. Um, so the first one here uh, that he has is Poe Dameron in the T-70 with R4, Astromech, Integrated Foils, Overdrive Thrusters, Hole Upgrade, Heroic, Black One, and Proton Torpedoes. 
Uh, next, he has Tezza Nance in the BTA Y Wing, the Resistance Y Wing, with Seismic Charges, Engine Upgrade, Ion Turret. Uh, Liga Fasang, also in the Y Wing, with Watchful Astromech, Seismic Charges, Engine Upgrade, and Ion Cannon Turret. Uh, Sai Thranali with Engine Upgrade, Automated Targeted Priority, and Ion Cannon Turret. And then uh, Bucket with the in the Fireball okay. here. Okay, so the first question I have to ask. Like, I get the two-point bucket, like, because that's all you got. Like, 100% get it. Did any of the Y-Wing's actual abilities ever peak? Like, like Andrew, did yes. you ever use the actual Y-Wing abilities? Yes. Yeah, he, he actually did. And the uh, the reason that it works well is Liga. Uh, Liga's ability basically provides rerolls as long as the ships have calculates. And if you look at the base ability for the resistant Y-Wings, if you perform an action that's on an action card, that gives you that free calculate. So all three of those Y-Wings can do three, uh, three banks and boosts and get a calculate off of it. And then they get those re-rolls with that ability. And it also works with Bucket as well, since he's calculating. Um, and then just the amount of control you have with those ion cannon turrets. Um, I know that in some of these games, he's rolling three, four hits with those ion cannons and just you know stopping people from grabbing objectives for like a scramble or like cargo. And you know that's, that's really good. And Poe comes in and, and cleans it up. And Kai's ability uh, worked really well as well because uh, he was able to basically go oh, like leapfrog over his other um, his other ships and getting that free of a token. And yeah, he was really good. And I will say there were a lot of people at the tournament that were running Ion. Or, well, I wouldn't say a lot. I know there was at oh, least two Tezza, or three yeah. that were running um, Ion Ion heavy lists. Um, and it didn't dawn on me until I heard someone say it out loud. But Ion's prevent you from taking objectives because you can only take a focus action and mm -hmm. in an objective heavy meta that is a ridiculously strong capability i still don't <laughs> think tractors even need to be a thing anymore because they don't do squat but ions just got a lot stronger because you can't take any action other than a focus no and i, I agree with the ions and, and i'm interested to see this on the table only because so we have another five ship um, resistance list we've been looking at that does not have Y wings or ions, but has insane amount of um, uh, X wings. <laughs> and you know, like I like I this is this is the Poe I like to fly. Typically, I do not like the cheaper Poe at all. I like this Poe better. This personally, yeah, it's, it's my favorite Poe to boy. fly. Yeah, yeah. it just and, it really and... is. Just a clarification. I meant to say te uh, Tez's ability, not Liga's ability. Uh, thanks. Okay. Man. Appreciate it. <laughs> well cool all right next next one is alex banwert and he is flying oh, oh go ahead go ahead what were you gonna say? Right oh um I'll, I'll take it all right go ahead um it's flying anakin in the ada uh with uh malice brilliant evasion predator hull upgrade and ion cannon uh, Barris in the Delta Seven, uh, with why is JJ all of a sudden in front of the middle of the screen? Sorry, I hold on, I hit a, I hit the wrong, just keep going, hit the wrong button. What are you doing, man? You're just messing with the stream, seeing if they're paying attention. Is that what we're doing? No, <laughs> it's okay. It's not <laughs> um, so sorry, um, Barris with CLT concussion missiles, instinctive aim. Um, Ahsoka in the Delta 7 with Chopper, Compassion, and CLT. Uh, Click in the Nimbus class V Wing uh, with Besh, the R3, Concussion Bombs, and Delayed Fuses. And Tarkin with Besh, Concussion Bombs, Ion Missiles, R3, and Delayed Fuses. Um, Alex was, I think, if this is the list, I'm thinking it is. Alex was my first round. Um, and he was kind of shaking out some cobwebs in the first round. Um, so I got the win, um, but only because he missed the Anakin um, system phase pre-maneuver uh, with the Ada. And there was one time where I popped a zero stop rotate with uh, Rook, and he had forgotten that I could zero stop and bumped uh, Tarkin and Click into each other's bombs. Um, which was oh, a no. very big help with the concussion bombs. So, um, but other than that, it's a great guy. It was a really good play. Uh, the list was really, really fun to watch. Um, 
And yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I think for three points, click is a steal. So I ran click and I run wolf. I did not run the bombs on them um, at all, but I could see the logic in it. I mean, wolf's ability to be able to say, hey, I'm going to have two target locks out there. I could eye on you or I don't have to eye on you. If I eye on you, though, you're going to run into my bombs next turn. Um, and then click to say, yeah, you don't get range one bonuses. Like, so I don't know if he used click that way against you, but that, you know, like I would be, I would be target locking my own team so that every time boss said, Hey, look, guess who's going to throw a bunch of dice at you? Be like, no, no boss. That's not how that works. Um, I just realized what you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just filled in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> all right oh, so the fantastic. next one here um the next one here is my list here so this all is right we can skip this a... list it's just i can mute <laughs> no. this guy. i think i think i can mute him. <laughs> so this is a variation of the adepticon list that i brought um this is actually what i ran in the redemption tournament um after adepticon so uh, the biggest change here was my Gina. So um, just to break down my list, Gina in the B-Wing with Marksmanship, Projectory Simulator, Jamming Beam, Blazer Bomb, and Stabilized S-Foils. Uh, Tendum with Trajectory Simulator, Auto Blaster, Proton Bombs, Afterburners, and the Foils. Braylon with Sync Lasers, Cluster Mines, Afterburners, and the Foils. Ezra Bridger uh, with Compassion and Leia. AP5 with Sabine Wren, Spare Parts Canister, and R4 Astromech. So the biggest change I did, uh, previously I had Gina with thermal detonators on her um, instead of Blazer Bomb, but I actually gotten to like Blazer Bomb a lot better. Um, I felt in all of my matches, with the exception of my first match, which was chance engagement against Andrew Cox, um, I, I didn't even get to use this bomb, but um, the other three games that I had, this definitely made a difference because um, in combination with Sabine, if you get caught in the area of the blazer bomb and the actual initial charge itself is actually larger than like a proton or like a seismic charge, like it has a wider area for that initial explosion. And I'm able to catch a lot more ships with that and uh, trigger Sabine to either give them a stress and eye on a tractor. Um, and I was able to use this pretty effectively to either uh, jam ships that had tokens um, or double stress them because if they were on the back part of that blazer bomb, I can give them a Sabine stress, then the blaze the blazes added on. And if it overlapped that ship, they would get an additional stress uh, from the blaze bomb. And then, of course, they were roll for damage as well. So this helped work as a really good effective tool to deny them uh the actions to take objectives and to um and to limit their dial to or where they were going to go and then that really helps the b-wings just come in close and just finish off the ship that's there so um i actually like this particular loadout a lot better now spiritually i feel like i'm three and one but uh, oh i did come God. in two and two and uh and it was it was a a, a tooth and nail fight with uh in the last round there against Charles, but Charles just managed to to come in and uh, that napalm just keep is those nuts. Things, yeah. That blazer bomb is nuts. I enjoyed it, even though it was used on me to extreme yeah. precision. I liked it. I I want to yeah. I want to run it in something. Yeah, the blazer bomb actually, and that Jay, when JJ and I were at Adepticon, we were talking about that in the room uh, at night. It was like, ah, that's just such a much better bomb, I think, than some of the the people are giving it credit, especially for the ability to hit a wider breath than you can imagine. And with Sabine, it's like, oh, it goes off. Oh, another piece goes on. Oh, you hit it. Oh, here's more Sabine shit for you. <laughs> 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 it's the, the, the triggers, the triggering ability for it. Like, uh, how about this? I would 100% dump protons on 10 nub and put a second blazer bomb in that list if it were me. And that's just like, I'm that's that's me. You know, I, I would 100% yeah. do that just for the pure fact of I like that bomb better for the Sabine triggers than anything else. So Especially because you could track through somebody into clusters. You could track through them. Like, it's yeah. crazy what you can do. I, 
I've actually considered running two blazer bombs, but what I've been finding is that I've actually been getting a lot of, uh, going against a lot of ships, mainly Jedis, that only have one shield, uh, like the CLT Jedis. Yeah. So, and since I can trigger which bomb goes first, I can use the blazer bomb first to knock out that shield. And if they're in, in range of the proton bomb, now they're taking a crit. Or I can track them into the range of the, the proton bomb and now make them take a crit as well. So that one-two punch really helps um, to strip shields and get a crit early. I know in my match with Charles, I got that structural damage onto Bosk, and yeah, yeah, there was it was he was done after that. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's definitely definitely a lot better than than I originally thought it was going to be. So yeah. All right, you do we have another list? All right, I guess we have we two can go more over lists. Crispy's list. Yeah, let, yep. let's go absolutely. Let's, Yep, let's go through the next two, and then um, we're going to move on to a different topic. Because <laughs> we spent 50 yep. minutes on the already. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, man. All right, so Crispy, uh, running a Maul Gauntlet with Predictive Shot, uh, Cutthroat, Pelimato, Jabba the Hutt, Queel, Veteran Tail Gunner, Contraband Cybernetics, Drop Bay, uh, the Knight's Brother title, and yeah, it's coming off there. And then the Swivel Wing, uh, Sirisu and the M3A with Elusive, Afterburners, Shield Upgrade, and Auto Blasters. To Pusk, make an appearance in the Hawk here um, with Marksmanship, yeah. Projectory Gleb, and Cloaking Device. And then Gamut Key with Hondo, Anaka, and False Transponder Codes. I will uh, say Charles, there was one. I will yeah. well, just real quick. I want to say there was one game that I was watching Crispy fly this, and he used Hondo to coordinate one of his opponent's ships that was stressed so that they couldn't take the action because they were stressed and then jammed one of his other opponent ships to break a target lock. And I'm like, that is amazing. That's Freaking brilliant. Hondo. I will say I think Hondo is underrated, and I think better players than me can run Hondo a little to, to extreme, you know, like, like you really can, especially with those lower initiative ships like that. Like, mm. Yeah, highly effective. He he did uh, his maul though. His maul gauntlet fighter just constantly being able to stop and still take actions with contraband cybernetics and Jabba the Hutt just re uh, regening that um, that charge on contraband cybernetics was just crazy. I know that in one of the games that I was looking at, he had like nine stress tokens, and then I think later on he had another match where it was thirteen stress tokens on his maul. And once he puts him in a location where he's good to go and he has the majority of the field in his arc, he's just going to keep him there until you either try to take him out, uh, which he can then queel and uh, basically heal half of the damage he just took in the entire game and just stay on the board. I don't think he ever lost Maul in any of his games at all. Like, it was crazy, crazy good. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm confused what the predictive shot is. I don't understand, like, if that ever got off, I mean, maybe it did. It was probably filler, honestly. Filler. Yeah, but you don't. Okay, but we don't have to fill anymore like we used to. But I know, I know. But like me with jamming big, I mean, like if it's it's there, okay. it's just. You and then, in. And yeah. I can see. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, like I just don't see it. Um, but I I will say, so we talked last week about my Mando build. This is similar mm -hmm. to my Mando build, but for one more point and with mall on it instead with three fours so like this seems almost a little bit more fun to run <laughs> right and i like mall um once i get my mall ship painted up uh hopefully somebody will help me paint ships here i want to see somebody run this i want to see somebody run the the six force mall oh yeah that's that's gonna be nuts yeah. running mando the child savage and hate so if you don't shoot at me i'm regenning force uh, and if you do shit at me, I regen that much more force because I get one from the child plus whatever I get from hate. Oh, mm -hmm. that's really good. Yeah. All right. Last one is Clint Chambers. One Charles? of the nicest guys like in the freaking world, too. Just just a side note. Anyway, Clint was running first order. Uh, I think he was the only first order list there. Um, I was able to give him one of those Kylo uh, ASMR wrens that I picked up at LVO. <laughs> uh, running Malaris in the TIE FO. 
uh, with cluster missiles, Scorch in the TIE FO with crack shot, uh, Revis naked in the TIE FO, Ren or Kylo in the silencer with extreme maneuvers, advanced proton torpedoes, ion missiles, and sensor scramblers. Uh, and then Gideon in the uh, the Z class shuttle uh, with Terex, uh, Commander Pyre, fanatical and elusive. Um, unfortunately, because this is first order nonsense that I don't know anything about, I'm going to have to defer to JJ to explain why this <laughs> list is in existence because I don't know anything about first order other than that I hate when it's across the board for me. So starting with Malaris, right? So Malaris. This ability allows uh, Malaris to take a stress um, at the start of their engagements, and then they can convert all their focuses on offense and defense to hits or evades. So pairing Malaris with cluster missiles, you now get two shots that you can do, and you have mods on both. Um, double modded on the first shot and single modded on the second shot with um, with the ability. So this is a really great budget TIE fighter uh, for the first order that does a lot of work um, engaging multiple ships. Scorch, of course, uh, just having that third die uh, to shoot and crack shot to make sure that it goes in. Um, both of those being backed up by Gideon with Agent Terex, um, giving out that that uh, calculate token to um, to boost Scorch's uh, offense. He can take a, a target lock if he needs to, and then just have that single calculate to also back up that uh, that shot. Uh, doing really well. Revis also uh, usually gets double modded as well if he gets uh, the Commander uh, Malaris target lock. Um, like in, in his range, he also gets a target lock onto that single ship. So they can really focus down on a on a single enemy and really like burn them down pretty good. Kylo Ren in the in the silencers. The Malaris so Revis lock? Revis uh gains a target lock on uh on an enemy ship that gains um a oh, red okay. token. Uh, so if Malaris locks an enemy and he's in range of that enemy that was just locked, he also gets a target lock as well. Um, so you can send him in to go get an objective uh, using his action. And then if Malaris at initiative five comes in, uh, gets an enemy into his in his range to target lock and uh, Revis is there too. Now they both have this, uh, this, the mod onto that single ship. So really, really effective there. Um, Kylo Ren, always really good in the silencer with extreme maneuvers, APT, ion missiles, and sensor scramblers. Ion, uh, uh, Kylo can um, can go in really hard and fast with sensor scramblers to grab an objective, then decloak, and then start coming in from behind, uh, especially effective with extreme maneuvers. And then Gideon has just coordinating whatever he needs to. If he gets shot, he gets fanatical turned on, and he he's good for the rest of the game. Um, and Pyre is, un, is criminally... Uh, underrated for the first order. I mean, he Stop. just gets those rerolls uh, with all the stress that's being put out on the board with the range zero bumps. Um, he's always going to have rerolls constantly on defense. So really, really good. Well, Commander Pyre is the one that hands out the stress at the beginning of the game. Yeah, he hands out two stress in the beginning of the yep. game, and then he gets rerolls if the end if the opponent has stress. So yep. yeah. All right, so let's transition to our next segment. I'm glad we went through that um, piece of it, but let's go. Let's go into something else um, and talk a little bit about something else here. So what I wanted to do tonight is have a little bit of a conversation because uh, we've, we've had an internal conversation or at least a couple of us have where we talked a little bit about um, the discussion on the decline or the shift in the de demographic for 2.5, right? And so we spent a lot of time having like positive conversations, right? Like this is really good. This is really, you know, awesome, blah, blah, blah. We had a great time. But I think what really, what we really need to do is why let's see, let's put our feelers out the wind and, and can we put some sort of like a gauge mechanism inside of there to, to try and find out what has happened with 2.5. Um, so we've had a lot of dissent in the community you know, um, in certain circles more than others, but we have had some dissent in the community where people are saying, Hey, I don't feel 2.5 was the correct direction to go. Um, we don't feel it was rolled out properly. We think it's helping to move the game in a different direction that we don't want it to go in. And we believe it will be the beginning of the end. Um, and I think that's an important discussion. Even if we don't spend a long time on it, I think that's a good conversation to have. Because I think it, what it does is it lets people get the feelings out that they have. And it allows people to kind of talk through different things. And, and 
some of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, do we feel X-Wing has lost players due to these changes? Are we seeing that? How do we quantify those changes and, and, and those, those decline or increase, right? Um, what is some of the differences that they have between 2.0 and 2.5? And I think the reason these conversations can be um, very important, right? And and I know not everybody in the... <laughs> Not everybody on our team even agrees with me specifically that I believe AMG is a little bit more engaging than FFG was. And I don't want to have that conversation again because we already had that conversation. <laughs> but, um, well, we could, I guess. We're not going to. No, we're not going to do that. I'm going to say no. Let's not don't go do down it. that path again. But either which it's way. Trap. Right? It's a trap. Either which way. There was a discussion that was on one of the um, Legion podcasts where Asmodee is actually actively addressing AMG and how they handle PR, we'll just say, right? We don't know a lot about it. They didn't want to share a lot of details. I did go through and listen to that podcast, which is really hard because I don't understand a fucking thing about Legion at all. Like, I just, I don't understand it. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Um, but there was some good conversations a little bit around that where they are going back and having that type of a conversation. And so whether AMG listens or does not listen, it doesn't mean that these are points that if the game is going to end, let's say in the next year or two, that a continuing community or those of us that want to keep that game, this game going should be looking to take into account. Now, with that being said, we're always going to have outliers, right? You know, originally when people were complaining about Nantex, it felt like an outlier. A lot of people were saying, hey, we should be cautious. Is it really that good? And then when it won, I don't know what, four GSP tournaments, um, three or four of them, that's when people yeah. were like, okay, well, seriously, this this is bullshit. <laughs> you know, like, we really need to, to I guess I got to turn the explicit tag on now. Um, we really need <laughs> to, um, we really need to fix that. And I think that these type of conversations are important for the longevity of the game. And I think they're they are important to, for the health of the game. I don't know. Does, yeah. does anyone want to volunteer to begin? If not, I'll go first. Yeah, sure. So um, I think the first thing that we should take a look at is um, like changes that have happened to to the game previously, right? And how it affected the 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 community first. Um, so first and foremost, I got to say the biggest change that we've had in X Wing ever was the change from 1.0 to 2.0 by far um that not only changed the way how uh, a lot of the core mechanics was you know introducing turret rx uh to not having uh, to now having linked actions uh to going from having unlimited bonus attacks to uh, having only a set limit of bonus attacks limiting down to one um also the um adding to other factions breaking up the first order and resistance from rebel and empire um a, and making five factions now instead of three and then adding on two more later on um i think by far that was the biggest change to the game of x-wing from from 1.0 to 2.0 um by far uh the other part of it was um the core sets uh that had to be repurchased right because now you need a new templates that had the marker in the center to adjust how you can barrel roll in the game um and then the other part of it was as well uh was the conversion kits uh, for you to play your um, to to play your your collection in the 2.0 standard, and then on top of that, introducing a new format which was hyperspace at the time, uh, which was a quote unquote curated list that um, that FFG had at the time, where you could only play a select amount of ships um, in that particular format, and that was used as their um, as their defining format going forward for a lot of their um, their big events for like system opens and uh, and regional events where it will be hyperspace only events where you can only play those types of ships in the list um that that definitely impacted the community a lot there are a lot of people um that i knew here uh, locally that stopped playing the game because they felt that it was a huge financial investment um and and just keep in mind that the conversion kits when they first came out they were 50 dollars a piece per faction 
And if you're a player like myself who played every single faction, you had to pay $50 for Rebel, Empire, and Scum. And now you also have to pay two $25 uh, conversion kits for First Order and the Resistance in order to have those ships available um, to play in the formats. And that's a huge, huge investment that you have to, to pay in order to keep playing those ships in the new format for 2.0. Um, a lot of people were were just not in agreement with that huge points investment um, and having to rebuy all this cardboard and all these collectibles and swag that they, they've collected from the various tournaments that they've done in person, um, basically now obsolete. So um, in my local, we saw a very big dip in people coming into playing a league uh, because they just couldn't do it. And um, it, took a, it took a long time for that to recover from then. Um, now, taking a look at the change now from 2.0 to 2.5, um, and, and I'm going to kind of address this without having going too deep to it. Yes, the rules change was a major, major factor that made a lot of people decide that they did not want to go into 2.5. That is, that is set. That's fact. We know that. Beyond that, I can still play all my ships. I don't have to buy any conversion kits for it. Um, yes, there's a few rules that we have to learn. Um, luckily, I had previously purchased the Epic Expansions Packs, which gave us the objective markers that we can use for standard play. Uh, but beyond that, I, there was not really a financial impact that was felt throughout the community for you to continue to play. And um, and I, I think that uh, from, from that particular perspective, physically, uh, there's not much of a difference in terms of like what you have to invest to get into the game to play um, uh, like it was from the 1.0 shift to 2.0. Uh, yeah, and I think I, I guess I wasn't around in 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 1.0, so I don't really have that piece. I will say that the rules changes have been a harder adjustment for reoccurring players, I guess. I yeah. will say that that has definitely been a, a negative effect on our locals. It has, um, we've had some people say we're done um, or say we're not done, but we're going to come back. Um, I think the, and, and again, I think some of these changes for reoccurring players make a big difference, right? And I'll be honest, like some of the stuff I own is no longer playable. Like and, and 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 I I feel JJ when we talk about you know the shift of having to buy the conversion kits. I own nine droids. Not that I could ever field them, right? But I own nine droids. And me being able to not field seven droids and what and have it be anywhere decent of a list, right? Like feels like an overinvestment on my behalf, which again is my fault for investing in CIS. Um, but it does, there, there is pieces to that, that, that do have a, a negative feels bad. Um, people that bought extended chips, it's not being played as much. Like we openly said in our local, like I told anybody, if you want to run an extended list, I will hundred percent play you. Even if you trounce me because you have better interactions, I don't care because I don't want people to leave because they can't run extended it. I have and, six Star Vipers. I'll never be able to run six Star Vipers. You couldn't run them ever, before, though. You never. I, no, you're right. I couldn't. But I mean, like, so so here's the thing, right? And I'll and I'll speak on this as someone that has played this game since, uh, since its initial release. I bought the Red Letter Starter at Gen Con the release year, having no idea what the game was. I got out of the game for a while. Then I came back at the Scum release, and I have been playing this game nonstop since the Scum release. I can't say that I have the same woes that JJ does because until 2.0, I never played anything but scum. So for me, the transition from 1.0 to 2.0 was very easy. I bought one conversion kit. It covered the majority of my ships, give or take a couple of Star Vipers that they didn't give me the dials for <laughs> that I couldn't run. And I almost had to buy a new set of templates, but luckily that Kickstarter that JJ is so greatly enjoying now um came through <laughs> and put the lines on my templates for me so i never had to really buy anything new that i didn't want um i will say that this is a living game right there are people that have been playing magic the gathering since alpha 
I will tell you now that I have a friend who has like a winter like bear deck that he built from way back in Ice Age. Can it play against any deck that currently exists in Magic? Can it play? Sure. Is it going to win? Not in a million years. It can't deal with spirit. It can't deal with shadow. It can't deal with poison. It can't deal with this. It can't deal with that. There's been a billion rule changes between Ice Age and where Magic the Gathering is as a game now. They have gone through reiteration of reiteration of reiteration of Popper and all of these different play format styles to find the, the core formats that they use now. I think that if we expect X-Wing to stay stagnant and never grow and never change, then what we should have bought was Monopoly. And I'm sorry. <laughs> come, come at me. That's fine. Bring it. Bring every hate. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me wherever. If you want a game that never changes, that's fine. Go to Milton Bradley. Go to Hasbro. Go to Walmart. Buy your board games where the rules never change. They are always the same, and you can play them, and that's fine. When you're playing in a living game where we constantly need to challenge ourselves, we constantly need to update, it's going to change. They're going to try new things. They're going to see what works. They're going to see what doesn't. They're going to make changes. They're going to back off those changes. They're going to make changes. They're going to keep those changes. It is a living, breathing entity within the games that we play. And while I don't agree with every change, and I've been vocal in this podcast when I didn't agree with it, I've also said every time that I'm willing to give it a shot. I'm willing to play the game. I'm willing to see how it goes. I was not for scenario play in the beginning. I was not for dropping to 20 points in the beginning. I was not for road in the beginning. There were a lot of these changes where I, I didn't believe that this game was going to continue to be a fun thing for me. And this podcast was just going to become a place for me to complain about how much I miss the game I used to play. I will say that the games are faster. The games are higher pace. The games are more intense because of dice throwing. Yes, it has changed from 1.0. Yes, it has changed from 2.0. Do I think it's negative? No. Can I say that four people during our 16-person tournament came up and asked questions about X-Wing while we were playing X-Wing to find out what we were doing? Yes. Does that mean yeah. that the community is dying? No. Does that mean that the community is growing? Also no, because they just ask questions. But in this particular case, I'm enjoying X-Wing 2.5, if that's what we're calling it. I'm enjoying the way the game has grown. I'm enjoying the way that it's been played. I don't like the ban list because I think some of those cards should still be able to be played, but I understand the reason. Being able to move your ships afterwards, especially with objectives like, like Boba Crew, being able to place my ship right on top of an objective after ship placement so I'm getting points right off the bat without having to do anything, I understand why that change was made. So I don't disagree with it. Um, but overall, I am not above things changing. I've played Hero Clicks. I've played Flesh and... I still play Flesh and Blood. There's cards right there. Um, I've played X-Wing. I've played a lot of different competitive games. The one thing has remained a constant in every game that I've played, and it's with uh, Destiny. It's with Legion. It's with um, Imperial Assault. Any any of the, the FFG-related Star Wars games. Even D&D. Rules change. People figure out how to exploit a rule set. The rule set changes. We have to adjust. It's just how these games work. If you want it to stay the same, Nobody is saying that it has to it has to change. You can play there are, I guarantee there are still some places somewhere where people are playing 1.0. Right? They have their ships mm -hmm. from 1.0, they have all the cardboard from 1.0, they have the upgrade cards from 1.0 and they are playing 1.0. 2 weeks ago, I had an X-Wing video pop up in my TikTok feed. And what were they using? 1.0 ships. There are people still playing 1.0. There are people that never moved to 2.0. There are people that moved to 2.0 that will never move to 2.5. It's fine. Play the game that you enjoy. Play the rule set that you want to play. You can't come to Adepticon and play at the high-level tournaments. You'll never make it to Worlds playing 2.0 or 1.0. But you can still enjoy the game that you love. That's fine. But if you want to play competitive, you have to be willing to go wherever the, the makers want to go 
or you can do like like and I'll call this out first. It's flesh and blood, designed by a former world champ of Magic the Gathering because he got tired of what Magic the Gathering was doing. If you don't like what X Wing is doing, we live in a free marketplace. Design a game, have us test it, play it. Maybe you're the next big thing. Who knows? But right now, this is what we have. So complaining about it isn't going to change what what AMG is going to decide to do, or FFG or Asmode or whoever. It's 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 not going to change. So. Well, and I think one of the big things in understanding that is 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 looking at it and say, okay, hey, great. So we are here. Do we feel that we are losing too many players compared to where we were before? And is it that much different than 2.0 days moving from 1.0? Because that's where I don't have, I don't get to have an opinion, right? Because I wasn't around in 1.0. I can't tell you any of the difference. I can tell you what happened in Destiny when FFG stopped supporting it. I can 100% tell you that. But I can't tell you when, when it comes to X Wing where that falls. And I think one of the big things, right, moving forward is okay, so if we are here, we're here. How do we continue to make it better? Like, how do we continue to provide the feedback in some way, shape, or form? Is there a a preferred method of feedback that that you that you all feel would create an AMG um, notice? Right? Is there anything we can do to push them into some sort of a direction? No. No. And, and here's why. They're a multi-million dollar company. If we stop playing their game, they stop manufacturing the game. They save money fiscally. They pump that money into something else that somebody's already playing. MCP. Yep. I mean, like, like it's, so, it's so, just one so, of those so things where, most... like, I appreciate the idea, but no. They're going to make the changes to the game that they want to make to their game. They own the game. It is their game. But if you never learn and grow, you lose. Like that that's how that is. So so I mean, and then that set almost well, I'm, says okay. So I'm not saying that they're not willing to learn and grow, but I'm saying there's nothing that we're going to do. They could observe. But let's 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 look at the empirical evidence. When we first started and they introduced road as a minor change to the system, they knew full and well what they were going to release. Right, this was not a that's not an overnight business decision to change to twenty points and to do all of this. But when they released Road, the sky is falling. Oh my God, I'm going to stop playing X Wing. And then we got a GSP tournament with Road, and it wasn't that bad. And then they introduced another little change, and the sky is falling, and I'm going to stop playing X Wing. And then we played with it, and it's really not that bad. And then they released the points changes and the new rules and the scenarios and all of that stuff. And, hey, this is where we're going with this. And the sky is falling and I'm going to quit playing X-Wing because it's new and it's different. And it's not that bad. So so, so I, the, the correction, I, I guess, maybe there's a misunderstanding in, in what I'm saying. And, and I'm not okay. saying the, the change, the, the large overall change. That, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about little tweaks. So we, so because, for example... We've all complained about Republic being pretty strong right now, right? You know, mm -hmm. like they they are pretty strong. We all okay. I, at least I have complained heavily about trajectory yeah. simulators, <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm not the only one that hates trajectory simulator. Um, fair, okay. fair. So, Look, so I, the difference. I didn't being, win. I didn't win a Depticon, so it's not. It's not. It's not impressive. So. That it's could never... be user <laughs> error. That doesn't mean it's not an overpowered upgrade. <laughs> So, 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 so when I talk about changes or I talk about swaying the influence or I talk about them listening, I, I get your point in, in the aspect of they're not going to change and we're going to go back from scenarios and go back to dogfighting. And I personally wouldn't want that. I find just base dogfighting now that I have a scenario base boring. I will tell you when somebody asks me what scenario I want to play, I say I literally do not give two fucks right now. Like, I just do not care. Just pick a scenario. Whatever one, you, whatever one makes you happy. Because I played all of them so many times now, I don't. Ha it's like dogfighting. I don't actually have an opinion until they come out with like fifteen different scenarios. I don't care. You want to play the stupid little crates? Great. Do you want to play this one? Great. I don't care. I'm gonna have to play all of them at some point if I play a tournament. 
But the difference in, in, in having the conversation, because to me, if we aren't able to come up with constructive criticism that at some point, whether it's our show or other shows or other things that they listen to, is it worth having the constructive criticism conversation, right? At that point, it's not even worth having. And then B, if it's not worth having, is this really the game that we should all be following, right? Like at some point, you don't want that. Magic the Gathering it has, does listen in weird, weird little ways. They don't, <laughs> they don't listen to the point where they're going to change major rules, but they do listen and they do look at data when data comes in from tournaments. That, that's a fact. It does happen. Um, I've been fucked over uh, at least once because of that. Um, especially because I had a car that was worth a lot more money that's worth nothing now. But, um, you know, in, in, in the terms of A&G, so when I say, hey, how do we make suggestions? Where do we go on the positive side to say, hey, are you listening? Are they going to take advantage of that? If the answer is they're never going to listen to anything, then there's no point in us complaining. There's no point in us having those conversations and really, like, the, the momentum shift is we're just going to become dubious little things. And, and I'll be honest, like, if, if that's the game, I, that that's not my game, right? My sure. game is not going to be where I'm dictated to 24-7 and we don't have at least a tiny bit of say in terms of how things can happen. Um, Maybe that's just my jaded view, and I apologize for dismissing your vantage point on that with my with my viewpoint. I just have a dismissive view when it comes to massive corporations that do things and just assume that they're going to do what they do no matter what. Yeah. And, and that's fair, right? I mean, like we do see that in corporate capitalism all over the place. Like that that's why that's why capitalism can bite itself in the ass half the time because when it becomes too big, it just does what it wants to do and doesn't care what anybody says. Right. I would like to believe AMG hasn't hit that piece. And I would sure. like to believe that Asmo Day has hit that, but is going to trust their lower ethnicities so as long as they, they bring about financial um, uh, a financial gain, I guess, is the easiest way to say it. They don't care to some extent what they do. Like, I don't think Asmo Day gave AMG the FFG licensing and said, here you go. Um, we think you're going to make us more money in the aspect of they want more money, but they believe they can do it because they're a miniatures game and understand the logic of miniatures games and can produce a better game <laughs> than they believe FFG did. Whereas a lot of people are very diehard about the FFG thing. Like people don't believe AMG is doing the same thing. And there is changes that are a little uh, similar to um, MCP that do bring things a little bit closer for come. Um, but that's where I say, where, where is it? I mean, I guess JJ, you've been quiet this whole time. So somebody has to speak <laughs> other than me. Um, in this so aspect. like, so just, just going back to like the, the heart of like the original discussion, right. You know, like what, what changes have like affected the, the community mainly um, to the point that it could put, you can say that the community is in decline, right? Um, obviously, you know, we talked about rules. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, just like, you know, the, the the data that we have so far for, like, the scenarios and how it has affected the game in general. Um, the biggest thing to look at is just the biggest events right now. To date right now, the only event that we have under our belts right now um, in terms of, like, like significant amount of data is Adepticon. Um, Adepticon, we had oof, what it was close to like 200 players, if I'm not mistaken, over there. And you know, if, if this was a game that, um, that you would qualify as going into the decline, you would not see those numbers because those are numbers that are, um, those are numbers that are, are equal, uh, or at least very similar to previous events that were held for 2.0, um, under FFG for like their, their world's qualifying types of events there. Um, I think that it by Nova, uh, when NovaCon comes out, when we have that a particular event, if we see the same type of numbers or better um, for that that um, for that particular event, then that shows that the competitive scene is still very well and alive. Now, the quality of the game that's always going to be uh, a perspective, right? Everybody has their own perspective on what they feel about the game and how the game is going. But if we're looking at the competitive sense, if 
the competitive players are still going to these events. And, and mind you, these are not cheap events. This, you have to put a significant amount of financial resources to go over there. I mean, you're booking flights, you're booking hotels, uh, you're paying for food because you're eating out most of the time. Like this is a big financial investment that you're putting into to attend one of these events. And you're not doing that for a game that you don't enjoy or a game that you're you're just feeling half-hearted about. Um, so uh, I think that that will um that that is a, a big gauge for the competitor side now on the local side there is a few things that we do have to address that do affect the numbers right one of the biggest things um for for the local scene obviously COVID. COVID has had a huge impact in in the world in terms of like restrictions for being able to attend in person um to to have these games i know locally for us we originally had cool stuff games in our area that had um that was our local store that ran the x wing events for us um when COVID came they shut down they didn't have any more um uh they they weren't able to run anything related for like tourneys or leagues in our area and they ended up closing down one of their shops over in um by uh ucf uh which, which is one of the places that i played for a while in addition to the south orlando location and then finally when COVID and re, um, like the restrictions for COVID were coming down, uh, they started uh, reopening, but they never went back to it. So we lost our location uh, for us to play. And the shop that we were playing in um, had a limit for how many people we can have at one time playing next wing. Um, I think uh, Chris, correct me, or um, ten, or <laughs> Charles, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it like ten people? I think at max that we could play at at uh, at, at uh, house rules. At house rules, uh, yeah. <laughs> It depended yeah. on what other stuff was happening because you could fit one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight. You could fit 10 in that room. It was cramped, but you could fit 10. Yeah. If we had a big enough show out, I think that, that Chris would have opened up that other side room to us if we'd had the people. But let's be fair. Even at our largest league night, I don't think we ever got above eight. Maybe yeah, we had I, 10 I at one point in time. When you compare it. Yeah. Yeah, but like when you compare it to when we, you know, pre-COVID over at um, at Cool Stuff, at some at one point we were having eighteen to like twenty people come up for league, you know, and that's a big thing. Oh yeah, um, and, and they have much much more tables available for us to play there, uh, whereas it was a little more cramped there at uh, at House Rules. Um, and then on top of that, all the restrictions that we had, you know, for like having to wear masks at all times and stuff like that, there are people who weren't comfortable with that um, and um, and didn't want to be in that kind of situation for either reason. Um, so I, I think that is definitely a, a huge factor for for why at least some of the um, some some local places might have gone into decline in terms of the game uh, to, to like to like show attendance and stuff. Um, and beyond that is, uh, you know, just keeping in contact with those people in the first place. I mean, we were fortunate enough in our own local league to have a, um, a, a, a chat where we were keeping up with everybody, um, despite, you know, all the COVID stuff that was going on and, uh, and organizing on our own, uh, to making sure that, you know, we, we were announcing when we we're going to have <laughs> events. So one time was league and stuff and just checking out who was showing up at league and, and just organizing the players to to make sure that we had those local events going on and um and keep them running um and that was a, a big big thing you know yeah all right well i think we've exhausted that topic again and i think it's at the point where we could just move past and say hey i don't like to feel like the fly better podcast um and no shade but if you listen to their last like argument that they had like halfway through the podcast it was um it was very hard to listen to. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> like I honestly turn it off more times than, than that because there was just so much uh, like, and it, it's like they, it, it almost felt like they were like, we can't talk about these other things. So we have to like argue about 2.5. And it's like, I don't ever want that. Like for this cast, like it's like, I, I know we don't agree on AMG's engagement value, but we don't need to have that type of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um. Anyway. So, we're not going to get in. We're, we're going to start the, the the progression for the the, the next segment here. Um, and essentially what I want to do is I want to analyze each of the different scenarios, which for some reason, I don't know why I felt there was um, five scenarios. 
I don't know why. <laughs> I don't. I really do not remember why I thought that. And I think I said that twice on the show today. That there was five I, scenarios. I mean, if you count the extended play, that's technically five. But okay, yeah. like <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so what I want to do is is tonight what we're gonna do for the last few minutes of the show is we're gonna kind of go through and let's outline what we want to discuss, what we want to capture. Because what I feel objectives. is is go ahead. Objectives. Said, what do we want to capture? I said objectives. Okay, <laughs> very good. Ah uh, ha ha, Charles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Way to derail. Um, what I want to do is we want to capture um, different pieces for each of the factions. And like, I would love to be able to do a full fact of you, know, like all the factions for like assault of the satellite. Ray. I don't know if the conversation is going to take, but I think if we can, oops. Oh, you can't see me. No. Now you can see. Me. Um, yeah, you're, you're Walt I'm, Disney there for a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I had my <laughs> static image up um, anyway. So, yeah, I think I had it up earlier too. But anyway, so we um what I want to do is like let's talk through what are kind of some of the main points. How are we going to categorize this? And, and anybody that has input, you have one week because in one week we're going to be just, that. That's what I want to tackle. Like unless we have some other major tournament that comes up, I want to tackle each of these different scenarios and talk through the different factions and talk through the different logic of these scenarios. So I'll go ahead and paste what I feel were the pieces for us to discuss. And then what we can do from there is we can engage with each other to say, Chris is wrong or Chris is right. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and we can either add. Or so subtract. I think we, I, I think that before we, we get started, I think we should actually review the actual scenario itself to, to like, look at the wording and what exactly it, it means for, for newer players that haven't, um, like played these scenarios or haven't had the chance to, um, to play like 2.5 and, and be familiar with what the scenarios actually are. All right. I can ironically enough, bring that up. <laughs> I actually weirdly keep some of these scenarios open on my computer. So <laughs> when I'm, when I'm two sheets to the wind at night and have to look up which one, when somebody goes assault of the Saturday LA and I'm like, Oh, what's that one? I don't remember what that one is. So let me look that up real quick. Yeah, I posted the link on our uh, our thing. All right, so it's up on screen. Uh, go ahead. Okay. All right, so the first one here, Assault at the Satellite Array. Uh, so this one here, um, standard uh, format here. You're playing on a 3x3 three three mat with six obstacles. Um, at the start of the of the game, um, during the place obstacle step, place one satellite in the center area, and then uh, starting with the first player, you take turns placing uh, four satellites at range three of the center satellite. Uh, to, uh, you're basically going to put two towards the edge of one player and two at the other edge of the other player, and then one in the center, totaling five different um, uh, satellites, and then you place your obstacles as normal. Um, scoring at the start of the game, each player earns mission points equal to the um, to the amount of the opponent's deficit. Which, if you build to a full twenty point list, you don't have to worry about that. At the start of the end phase, each player earns one mission point for each satellite under their control. A player controls a satellite if they have one or more ships at the range zero to one of the satellite than any other player. When determining control of the satellite, medium and large space ships each count as two ships worth. When a ship is destroyed or removed from the game, the opposing player earns mission points equal to the squad points value of that ship. Uh, the victory conditions here is that at the end of the end phase, if one uh, only one player has ships remaining in the play area, they win the game immediately. Uh, the second one is is at the end of the, the end of the end phase, if one player has 20 or more mission points and has more mission points than the other player, the game ends. Uh, the other one is at the end of the 12th round, the game ends. And then at the end of the game, if both players have at least one ship remaining in play area, the player with the most mission points wins. And then the scenario rules for this one is that a scenario feature is a type of marker that is placed into the play area to facilitate scenario play. Scenario features are objects but cannot be moved or attacked or damaged, locked or destroyed, unless specifically stated in the scenario rule. And that's it. All right. You want to go over every one of them? Uh, let's concentrate on just uh, on this one for now, and then we'll we'll see where we go. All right. 
So essentially, to me, what I wanted to discuss is what are the win conditions, right, for that scenario, right? What are my win conditions? What do what type of lists work best? It, it, when do we pivot the type of win condition, right? Because there could be multiple win conditions that you could have based on your list. And I think there was an interesting conversation um, <clears throat> that somehow took place on on Fly Better where they were actually kind of talking about if your play style, like your list is to kill things. So like, for example, that's why I asked Charles that question. Did you get more mission points than, you know, you got kill points? And he's like, no, I got more kill points. His list is designed to just murder things. That's what he wants to do, um, which is probably his play style to some extent, except for um, he likes bombs and boba. So neither one of those are fitting into that scenario, unfortunately for him. But, um, you know, the, the, his play style is specifically murdering things. That's what he likes to do. And he wants to do it as scummy as he can in, in, right. in a way that will make you go, what the fuck did you just do? And yep. why is that? <laughs> I want to yeah. say there was a point in somebody's game where somebody did something and his opponent went, you know what? You could be cheating and I have no idea. So I'm just going to trust you to know what you're doing and hope that it's right. <laughs> That's how a scum player lives. Like I have so many upgrades now that you can't tell whether I'm, what I'm doing is accurate or not. You just got to trust that I'm not lying. Yeah. Very so Benicio I think... del Toro in, uh, in, it was that his solo. Is that where he, uh, where yeah. he played? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think uh, when you take a look at the win conditions, we got to look at the the types of lists um, that you can that that are commonly seen here in in at least the current meta that we've seen so far, right? So we take a look at each faction. Um, I'll go with the one that's been the most prevalent um, that has won a lot, a lot of games, and we'll look at the Republic, right? Um, typically, with the Republic, you see a lot of uh, lists that start with like either uh, five Jedi's or at least five ships, um, or a variation of it, which will be one big support ship, namely uh, like the Lat, um, and then four other ships that go out and control objectives here. Now, um, if you're flying that type of like uh, a list there where you're going in fast and furious with like these high agility ships, um, you're your win condition here is trying to at least keep the objectives that are in your in the are outlier locations. Um, if you if you're setting up those objectives to be closest to the corner as possible for your end to control, you want to keep your weakest ship in that area to constantly try to collect that um, that particular objective, um, while the rest of your list can go in and try to grab the remaining ones, right? So you always want to try to control that at least one point that you're constantly generating all the time. You may end up facing off against another enemy ship that usually will come alone to try to take that out, or at least contest that particular objective. Um, but you can force your opponent to come to you and waste at least two turns, uh, which when you look at the average, that's about a little over a quarter of the game trying to go out and try to contest that objective from you if you can control it. Now, for the rest of your list, um, the the uh, the objective placement is very critical, right? Because when you're placing your um, your objective markers, um, you if you place them as as close as possible within that range three bubble, having a medium base ship um, that can fit in between those two objectives is a huge huge boon because you can essentially contest two objectives with one ship, and then have the remaining ones of your ships either go in to support around to try to contest the other objectives or try to reduce the enemy's numbers um, so that way you can score those other objective points there. And I feel that's where the the power of the large and medium base ships are um, when you're when you're flying these particular scenarios. In my game with Charles, um, he had boss between two different objectives, and there was nothing I could do about it. He can control those easily, and, if, and since my forces were scattered, he was able to score those points without me being able to do anything about it and, um, and just sit there very comfortably so uh even though i had more ships in my list mine's a five ship list then he had three large bases in in that scrum and towards the center he had that advantage because the the medium and large bases are worth more than the small bases so and and this is where i feel <laughs> so so we get we have to focus in right like like i so i get your point like uh, placing objectives closer together blah 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 if you have bigger ships but i want to take this in a different direction. Like I want to actually take each faction. So you would wanted to break the factions down 
And I'm opposed personally. I'm opposed to breaking down every faction and every ship and looking at them and saying, this is good. This is bad. I'm saying, I don't care about that. What I care yeah. about is my objectives, right? What is my mission for this, this round? <clears throat> what is that? And how does each of these play into it? So I, I don't feel like understanding. I think on a high level understanding it, but, but if you have multiple different ship, things, so, so for example, I ran a Republic seven ship list, right? That's what I ran. I had no big ships. So the placing them closer to the center did me no good. That would be pointless for me in that aspect because it gives somebody that has a larger ship base the opportunity to come a murder me. <laughs> and then on top of that, B take the objective points away from. Me. And so that's what I'm saying is there's got to be archetypes or styles of archetypes that we have for each of these objectives or each of these missions based on the faction that we've seen. Right. And so obviously one of them, like you said, is, High agility ships with force and one support ship. And I'm going to say that because the high agility ships like the V-Wings, whatever. Like, if you give me V-Wings, great. If you give me force users that have high agility, there's a huge, like, there's a huge difference in play type. There's also a huge difference in how many ships you can fit in there. But there's a huge play type difference. And so I can't sit there and agree with you that all all of the objectives need to be placed closest to center for every one of these play types. No, I was just saying, if you do, if you end up with that particular archetype with the, uh, with the medium base and the fours, you do benefit from that. But if you're playing with like the smaller bases, then you want it more spread out. So that way your, your ships can jump between scenario to scenario without having to go into like tighter, um, like tighter areas, like in the center. Fair enough. But and that's so, that's kind of the benefit of my list with the three large bases. As as much as I don't want to say it, it is ultimately like a, a Swiss Army knife. Like like I can pick up objectives, I can sit on objectives, I can be near objectives, I can shoot your ships out of the sky. Like for my list, I honestly did not care what the scenario was. I always flew the gauntlet down one side, Bosk slightly off center of the middle. And the Falcon always zooming down one side. I would grab one objective, turn one, zoom off to grab the second, turn two, and then circle the board and try and just kind of circle the scrum of ships and take pot shots. Every subject, every objective, no matter what, chance engagement, scenario, uh, satellites, sensor array, whatever, cargo, whatever, same strategy every single time. And with the exception of one game, it worked. All right, so let's let's go back to Republic. Let's let, okay. or or stick with Scum. I don't care which we stick with, but uh, you know the overall win. So what's the overall win condition for assault at the satellite? Right? Is it killing ships? Right? Or is it, it having your ships by the objectives? Which one is more beneficial on a on on a so level of all of them together? So taking a look at Republic, right? We'll stick with Republic. Republic has the majority of ships that have uh, high agility, right? You take a look at your V-Wings. You take a look at your Delta 7s. Um, these are ships that um, that have the mods, particularly the Delta 7s that um, have the force um, to use for mods. And then they can, either, um, they can boost into position using the force or their actions and then still have a regular token to maintain control there. Um, and because of their dials, they're able to uh, fly away if they get into danger and go after a different objective to contest it and um, and go on there. They don't have to actively um, engage like to win the objective because they are very good at going from objective to objective if placed correctly um, to, to get those points. And then they can take targets of opportunity to try to burn them down. Um, usually they'll try to go against the lower agility ships. Uh, um, that uh, that they can easily match off because the majority of these ships they're running with two die guns. Sometimes you're going to bullseye and get a CLT, or if you happen to have ordnance equipped, then you'll have a three dice gun that you can shoot out against that enemy. But you're not going to knife fight um, all the time with the Jedi's 
to try to score points rather than uh, try to control the objectives. And because you can spread out fairly easily and converge um, fairly easily uh, with uh, with you know boost actions or uh, just with the dials on those Delta Sevens, they can converge and, and disperse uh, on a dime. So um, I think their win condition there is just controlling those objective points by spreading out as much as they can, and then if they're uh, and react to their opponent how they're they're playing their objectives at those at that point. Yeah, and I think the other thing that you would say, right, is when we talk about objective placement, right, is you want to spread them out. You want to force your opponent to be broken apart so that that way when you get your opportunity shot, which is the great term, there you, that, that's, we should be, we should be uh, using that as terminology. Like, that's a great terminology. My opportunity shot gives, or my shot of opportunity, there you, I said it wrong already. Um, gives you the fact that if they're spread we out, contact, it allows you to get better we contact shots. Contact Eminem to to you only get one shot. There you go. <laughs> I like that. I think we would get um, DMC'd for that, but yes, we get oh, yeah, only one shot. <laughs> I think we can say it right. I don't think they can get us for saying. It's just if we play that sound clip. But I yeah, like that yeah, sound fair, clip. Fair. I do like him. So anyway, <laughs> now you're getting into. Now don't let's not go down to music territory because I saw three concerts this week. So you know. <laughs> it could be um, one of our Twitch redeems, right? <laughs> <laughs> or or do you want an after hour show where Tanner and Charles and JJ talk about music? We can do that. <laughs> Charles and I have similar tastes in music for the most part. So but starkly different in the in the same vein. Like <laughs> Similar styles, but man, our taste in, in actual band groupings is is quite different. Yeah. Charles is the um, more melodic, uh, heartfelt guy. We'll call him the heartfelt guy, whereas I'm the asshole, and I'm like the stone bridge. I want to scream at you. I want to throw things, and it's going to be so heavy that you're just you're going to shit a brick, and it, we're going to be like, hey, that fits the music. Come on, bring it over here, bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, so so you have one one type of ship faction for Republic, and this is why like I didn't know if we wanted to get into all of this tonight, just because this this is a longer conversation I think than we think it is, right? Because we have multiple yeah. factions, and maybe it's not. But when we talk about the different factions, and we we talk about this, like so you you've only we've only covered one faction of opportunity, like one style in the Republic faction. I think there's more multiple styles in Republic that don't have jedi in them they just it just doesn't feel as good because the jedi usually make it a little bit better yeah i mean we look at the winner for our tournament here um uh, jacob i mean he's running arc 170 um in that in that list uh which is not a jedi but it still is able to um to support uh with seven fleet gunner and if it doesn't uh um, choose the reload to re to bring back up seven fleet gunner it still gets a modded shot, if not a double modded shot with stability. Um, so it can keep that pressure um, to to take the attacks of opportunity as it comes and still contest scenarios. Um, so that is a nice like other variation of that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to do is I'm going to say, so we're going to bring it all the way back because I, I, I want to be done before 11 tonight. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> nope. Hundred percent, man. J J J just decided he was gonna go off on a tangent, and I'll scold you later. But well, <laughs> like, like, yeah, that's not the pot calling the kettle <laughs> black at any point in time in this podcast. <laughs> so, JJ, so, you're not allowed to tangent. Says tangent Tanner. No, well, I, I wanted to. What I my goal was was to establish yeah. what we were gonna discuss with each faction, and okay. next week we would dive into the different, um styles of each of the different faction because okay. again yeah, like sure. in, in fairness like we've we've barely scratched republic and we can get into scum and i think scum has undiscovered talent undiscovered talent and everybody in scum is just saying i'm going to throw as much red dice as i can and i don't agree with that like there's manaru there is um you know some of these smaller ships that could fit in there's gamut key and a hawk that that is being slept on in terms of how it could fit into this meta 
and, Unless your and, name is Crispy, at which point Gambit Key is a centrifuge of your of your list. Your but... whole list, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I will say I will say the reason that people are, and this is just between, and I'll bring this up next week when we when we talk about it a little bit more in depth. But from a scum perspective, one of the hardest things as a scum player right now is finding a viable multi ship list that can get you above that four or five ship curve, because most of our weapons. The fangs, the M3As, the um, it, and and really the the medium and large base ships are point costed so high that like like I I played a list at the beginning of 2.0. It was three naked fangs, two M3As, one with a tractor beam, and a mining guild tie. Right, that was it. That was the entire list. There were no upgrades except for one, which was that tractor beam. Pricing those ships out now in the current pricing phase that we're in that's a 26 point list yeah three yeah. like like six i1 ships are 26 points there's no reason that the i1 the i4 and a named fang are all five points something like and i'm as a, as a hardcore scum player it's hard to build multi-ship lists when most of our ships are point costed so high that it's prohibitive I'd rather have a big base ship with 12 health for six points, right? Because Lando is six points versus a four health Fang for five points. No, nope. yep. And I think there's, there's I think you're no reason. I think you're right, and I think I honestly I think we've all agreed that scum is overpriced right now. Like we really like. And, and not when we do it, the, not all of it. Let's not let's not jump off the deep end. Some of uh, them Boba's Boba price. and those sort of things are, are priced priced are priced okay. No, M three A's are still wrong. Yeah, I agree. I think Boba's overpriced, just, personally. But I mean there are some ships that are priced accurately, and I have no problem with them. But we have when every other faction, and I don't think uh, JJ, you can call me on this one if I'm wrong. But when every other faction has a five, six, or plus available list build for them, and you can't, I don't, I don't know of a viable scum build with more than five ships. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, would no. agree with you actually. If I, don't I think can't, if I can't match, there needs to be at least one availability for every single archetype for each faction even if it's only one even if if i want to run a six seven or eight ship swarm i have to run mining guild ties right? yeah, i that's think it. i think that should be our community challenge guys yeah if you guys join us on our discord post your scum list and we'll have to do do part of an episode where we'll like actually go through them and rank them and see if we find any really good scum lists that are, are potentially good. In, might be like, slept on. Maybe I'm all, and I could be overlooking everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not a perfect player, but as far as I, I know, know, with the exception of the mining guild tie, which are useless, um, there is no opportunity to get more than six ships. I know. Yeah. I'll take you out in a minute. We're almost so, out. Yeah. And so I think that's, I, and, and that's where I want to go. So, so the idea is, is we're, so when we come back next week, so I commit to this. There you go. And JJ, this is easy planning for you. We're gonna commit to, except for you gotta get crispy on stream. That that's what you do. You gotta, you you owe me that on Wednesday or next Sunday. I don't care if it's yeah. before the stream. I want it. Um. Anyway, so the we're gonna talk about win conditions, objective placements, um, the different styles of list. If we wanna, if there's any pivotal points for win conditions. And then if we have time, we could talk about examples of opening engagement um, and round one tactics, right? I think those are the heavy hitters for understanding each of the different scenarios. And, I, and again, I apologize. I should have stopped you earlier just because I wanted to make sure that we, we talk about assault of the satellite array. Those are what we're covering. We're covering that piece. And I want to hit every faction. So if it takes the whole show to go through that one objective, I'm okay with that for every faction. I think that's but that's viable. And and so we'll just break it up. So Charles owns scum. That's that's his ownership. Um I guess I'm gonna give Republic to Charles too, because that's the only other faction he flies. Um you know. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> All right, so, so it, it's it's really easy. JJ, you can have rebels. And um what other one do you want? I'll take resistance too. All right, so rebels and resistance, and then I will own um separatists and empire. 
and FO, I guess. So, and, and, and what I want to do is when we come back next week, that's what we're going to talk about for these different things. What is some like examples? And, and I don't care if you have a list example list or if you just have a shell of a list, you know, and Charles, I will challenge you to find a more than four ship scum list that you feel is viable. Sounds right? good. I'll, I'll dig around and see what I can find. Okay. All right. With that being said, we will be back on Wednesday with our community challenge streams. Um, we will maybe have Crispy versus JJ. Otherwise, uh, join us for probably uh, Tanner versus JJ because uh, Charles is still in training for his new job. So uh, he cannot commit to be here on Wednesdays as of right now. Um, but we will have some games for you on Wednesday night uh, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern going till I don't know, whatever, 11 o'clock or whenever we get tired uh, <laughs> to play. So Thank you all. If you would like, you can support us here on Twitch. You can support us on Patreon, or you can just give a like to our podcast on all your streaming services or over on YouTube. Thank you all. Have a good night, and we'll see you on Wednesday.